Joining us today is uh, Pranav Sharma, founding partner, Woodstock Fund. Pranav uh, will be answering some uh, questions on uh, is this really the change that everybody is promising or is it just another myth as uh, Jack says or as Elon Musk says. So Saurabh Sharma also with us. He is a general partner at Jump Capital. He leads crypto infrastructure investments for Jump Capital and has a diverse background also in computing infrastructure. Hi guys, welcome to CC. Just want to get some opening comments over here on which way do you think this is really going. Uh, Saurabh, if you want to sort of jump in on that question straight away and take us through, how do you answer these questions? If you were to reply to Jack Dorsey at the moment and say, well, there will always be vested interest, if not one particular person, then perhaps Mark Zuckerberg of the future or say Jack Dorsey of the future. How do you answer that? Yeah, I think my answer would be, first of all, I think that uh, pretty much all the applications that are building on Web3 are kind of in early phases and there's a path to kind of full decentralization. So, you know, uh, to, to start anything, there is, there's always a bit of capital required. Hmm. Kind of some, I call it Genesis Capital, and you know, of course, there are early folks involved. I mean, to that extent, Bitcoin is owned by a lot of institutions. Uh, so it is no different. Uh, I mean, we know Jack is a maximalist in Bitcoin, and in that sense, it's owned by VCs too, if, if, if I just use by that definition. But I think that really the thing to think about is you've got a starting point, got to you know, put some seed capital uh, to get these projects started, which is the whole... Uh, idea here that you got to give equal opportunity to every entrepreneur to get started. Uh, mm -hmm. And it could come in different forms. VCs are one form. There's mm -hmm. other forms of raising capital now uh, through the community. And there's a path to decentralization. Uh, the end goal for pretty much anyone who's building a network or a protocol mm -hmm. is going to be that this is going to be owned uh, and governed, which is a kind of keyword, governed by the users and community mm -hmm. versus Jack Dorsey as a CEO deciding who gets censored or not censored on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, the community votes and the community decides. And, mm -hmm. you know, in that case, then uh, I guess uh, it, it kind of leads to the end goal. So that's kind of sort of my maybe right, normal response. Sort of suggesting it's going to be fairly democratic. But it's, uh, I, it's, yeah. I don't know if that's a good thing, bad thing. There are lots of reference to that word. Let me bring in Pranav uh, on that note. Pranav, uh, just first opening comments, really, I want to understand from you on uh, how are we going to solve this problem? We are still a few years, let's just say a few years away from realizing Web3 and its full potential, right? Uh, initial money pumping in is understood. Once it's up and rolling, who controls the system? For example, who will look after misinformation if that is spread, for example? Who will be accountable? Today, if there is some inf misinformation, somebody puts out a fake article about, say, me on Facebook, I can write to them. I can ask them to put it down and authenticate. If there is no one entity, then who will perhaps play this role? So, so Sonal, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. And all I can say is that uh, Web3 is a journey and it's not a destination. And many, in many ways, in echoing what you know, Saurabh just mentioned, and it's a path to decentralization. And there is nothing like true decentralization because it's a utopia. So in that sense, you require private capital, you require various stakeholders. I see. Various hmm. stakeholders have their own perspectives and they want to interface. Hmm. And uh, when you're speaking about how people can engage and actively get their voice heard, there are mechanisms like you can have proposals on DAOs, you can uh, you know, sort of you know, engage with other like-minded investors to find mm. ways and means of contributing to a network. Mm. Uh, not only negatively contributing, because at times, you know, when you look at traditional centralized system, it's about contributing to exert your rights. But this is about uh, exerting, or let's say rather, in, you know, getting your rights included to sort of expand the network. Mm. To let's say, for example, in your own example, you know, culling out the fake news mm. and propagating uh, the good news. Mm. So you know, so I think uh, there is a huge space for something like this to grow over a span of time. I see. So what you're saying is that we are not there yet, but I'm just curious to know, is this conversation happening within the community as well? Because what really my takeaway from this entire Twitter battle that really happened between Jack Dorsey and the rest of the world, really Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk on one side and the rest of the crypto and blockchain enthusiasts on the other was that they are important questions that need to be addressed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll, uh, this is obviously a starting point, as I said, right? I, I, there is, 
uh, no one is saying and probably shouldn't be saying that we are there where it is going to be super obvious that this is a truly open, trustless, permissionless application mm-hmm. that anyone mm-hmm. can vote and it just works seamlessly. Uh, uh, you know, most of them are kind of in the seeding stages. And as Pranam mentioned, we are in the phase of building the infrastructure for mm-hmm. all this to mm-hmm. come. We are in the phase of building all the tooling that's going to require to, to run this efficiently. And mm-hmm. there's going to be, you know, any democracy which is trying to kind of perfect itself has some cost to it and there's some frictions to it. Uh, and I think this is, this is going to be a, somewhat of in a similar way. Uh, but but uh, so I think that today's debate, if, if I guess Elon says I, I don't see it, it's probably not, not as obvious. But there are, you know, there are pretty good examples of a lot of uh, projects which are out there. Uh, there, was a, there was a project uh, called SushiSwap, which is, you know, they were trying to raise some side money from VCs. Uh, the community opened up kind of debated against it, and that uh, that proposal was voted down. There are, as of today, happening in most protocols, any change in the protocol are being actually put out by the community. Mm. The community is voting on them, uh, and, and then those proposals are going through after the vote. There are, these are very good examples of these things mm. happening of some of the larger protocols, Compound, Aave. These are actually very much governed by the community of any upgrades to the protocol. Mm. And these are, many of them are dealing in billions of dollars uh, happening today and community being uh, part of it. Right. So what I'm actually getting a sense from in front of Vayne on this, we learned the word ethical hackers fairly recently, right, to understand the system better. So we are looking at activist investors now who will come and ensure that sort of the right things are happening and the money is going in the right direction as well. But one question that I have is, and this is often that pops up when it comes to money transactions, it could be on DeFi, it could be on anything else, for example, once you paid, you paid, right, on the blockchain. And if there are faulty transactions, etc., how does that entire reverse mechanism happen? Who do you take the complaint to? Who's regulating this? So, so I think, uh, so what you're hinting at is if there is a transaction, let's say, I'm just you know, putting an analogy here, let's say banking transaction, you know, hmm. I mean, especially if there's a cross-border transaction, how do you sort of reverse it? I mean, hmm. so, so it definitely it will go through litigation channels and uh, many times the money will not come back. So, so similarly here hmm. also, uh, you know, if you are doing a transaction, of course, it has to be a responsible way of you know doing a transaction. And there are definitely checks and balances in place. If you even, let's say somebody who's interacted with exchanges will see that there are multiple touch points hmm. to caution the user that they have double check, triple check, you know, if they are putting the right address for transactions. So I think so the point I want to drive here is the key point here is uh, responsibility and responsible uh, interaction with technology. Hmm. So the onus not only lies with, uh, you know, individuals who are transacting, but also hmm. the protocols which are designing in the right way and the infrastructure players, the way they are designing user interfaces. And all I can say is that when it comes to Web3, the infrastructure that Saurabh was mentioning about uh, has come a long way. Mm. And there are a lot of checks and balances in place for users to interact you know, very effectively. And as I was mentioning, this is a journey. So a lot of things are also getting uh, together. They're put, you know, being put into place, etc. And I think one, one point I want to make here is that, okay. uh, that uh, I would say the best uh, form of uh, compliance or uh, regulation is self-regulation or self-compliance or I would say self-governance and in this space you have the necessary technology framework in place it mm-hmm. is just about how you can interact and effectively with these in frameworks mm-hmm. as individuals as stakeholders to uh, you know uh, self-govern and I think that's a superior way of organizing self and organizing society I mean regulations are much more easier to uh, take things forward but I would say that I self-governance mm-hmm. is it's a better starting point. All right. So it is a journey. What a journey. We'll be tracking all those steps taken on that journey. Thank you both for joining us on this fascinating discussion.